Hey, I'm ready. Let's let's go ahead and get started. Um, today uh, is the last day of this quarter. This whole quarter has been about uh, some sort of aspect of justice. And so today's lesson title is Pursue Love and Justice. And so that's what we're going to be looking at here in the book of Hosea. So uh, why don't we go ahead and start off with the word of prayer and then uh, we'll get started. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to get together and study your word. Uh, thank you for uh, writing this down and, and allowing us and giving us the opportunity, the ability to, to look at it and to study. And as we uh, look at what you had to say to your um, people, um, Israel, uh, Lord, may we find encouragement, uh, challenge, uh, Lord, ways to be better followers of you. Uh, bless our discussion. May it be glorifying to your ears. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so today's lesson is from Hosea, and so what I like to do, and, and uh, this quarter has uh, primarily been on these uh, minor prophets, the 12 minor prophets in the end of the Old Testament, and so I'd like to start off by um, saying, what do you know about Hosea? Do we know anything about Hosea? He's my favorite prophet. <laughs> Why is he your favorite prophet? Um... He had to uh, take a woman of uh, that was not of his uh, choosing. God said, "Take, take her," mm -hmm. and um, she was not uh, uh, not a faithful woman, mm -hmm. and um, and he loved her. He mm -hmm. he loved her. Yeah. And yeah. Um, that, that's what God has done um, with um, his people. Um, mm -hmm. And it's Hesed. <clears throat> um, and um, it's just, this is just my, my uh, one of my favorite books. Well, mm -hmm. er, every time I uh, read it. And um, he just, uh, just chose to um, love her no matter what. And mm -hmm. he uh, uh, paid full price for her mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. to get her back mm -hmm. he she was not satisfied uh with everything that he provided for her he mm -hmm. he she just kept running away yeah from, yeah yeah um and but he paid full price for her to get her to come back yeah 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 the first uh i believe it's the first three chapters um hosea in Hosea, uh, he takes uh, this wife, uh, her name is Gomer, um, and God is using Hosea's marriage to Gomer as an analogy of his relationship with Israel. And so the first three chapters, um, the, the relationship between um, Hosea and Gomer is the relationship, is an analogy of the relationship between Israel and, and, and uh, God, and God is using this as a a lesson for for Israel to show that God will no matter what Israel does God will always come back and and uh love his people um and Hosea is to show this through his marriage to Gomer so yeah good anything else about uh, Hosea Hosea is the first of the minor prophets um, in in the the Bible, uh, at least in in the order that it's uh, it's uh, put in the Old Testament. Uh, Hosea prophesied in the Northern Kingdom, which the Northern Kingdom was named Israel. The Southern Kingdom was Judah, um, and we've been studying Israel and Judah here off and on throughout this quarter. Um, Hosea prophesies in the mid seventeen or mid seven hundreds BC. Uh, this is before any of the uh, kingdoms are taken into exile. Uh, I believe, if I have it right, that um, Hosea prophesies roughly 50 years. Uh, the first 30 are in the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom gets exiled, and then he goes and prophesies in the southern kingdom for the re remaining years. Um, so when he starts prophesying, none of the kingdoms have been exiled yet. Um, now play in, in when we study here in Hosea. 
Uh, he is a contemporary of Amos, and so I believe Amos was studied um, earlier in this quarter, uh, but he's a, he's a contemporary of, of Amos. Um, to give you some context, Jeremiah and some of the others that we studied are in the 500s BC, and so it's, uh, um, Hosea is one of the first here to be <coughs> prophesying. Um, yeah, all right, so that, that's Hosea, and, and so this is what we're going to be looking at here. The first, like I said, uh, the first three chapters are about Hosea and his marriage to Gomer, and that being an analogy to the relationship between God and Israel. And then uh, later on in the, in, the, in the book of Hosea, the relationship between God and, and uh, Israel is, is portrayed in some different relationships, which we'll see here in our scripture today. I want to start off here um, in our lesson, the uh, background scriptures in Deuteronomy 8. And so Deuteronomy, uh, I want to read this, 8, uh, 10 to 20. Um, <clears throat> in my Bible here, the heading of uh, chapter 8 says, Do not forget the Lord. Mm-hmm. And uh, as we study here, these, these minor prophets and, and the reason that Israel went into exile um, Deuteronomy 8 verses 10 to 20 kind of talk about that. Um, and at the end of our lesson, uh, we can come back to uh, what Deuteronomy says if we want um, to, to kind of find some challenge and encouragement for us with this. But I want to read this here first so that it gives us some context of why Israel is uh, facing the exile here in Hosea. So Deuteronomy 8 verse 10 through 20 says this. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known to humble and to test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your forefathers, as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. These words here in Deuteronomy from Moses to the the nation of Israel. And uh, it's a foretelling that if the nation forgets, the nation of Israel here forgets God, and everything else that goes along with that, um, destruction will come about. So let's fast forward here to Hosea. Um, our lesson text today comes from Hosea 11 and 12, uh, selected verses from those two uh, pieces of scripture there. Um, and so I think what we're going to do here first is we're going to look at uh, Hosea 11 first, uh, and I'll read verses 1, 2, and then 7 through 10. <clears throat> We'll uh, examine those verses, and then we'll get on into uh, chapter 12. So let's start here in Hosea 11, and I'm going to read again verses 1, 2, and then 7 to 10. Hosea 11, verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the further they went from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. Verse 7. My people are determined to turn from me. Even if they call to the Most High, he will by no means exalt them. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I turn and devastate Ephraim. For I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I will not come in wrath. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. 
All right, so let's start uh, here at verse one of, uh, of uh, Hosea 11, and, and let's dig in and see what it says here. So he starts off here first, when Israel was a child, all right? And uh, so this, uh, when, when we see this type of thing, you know, a nation as a child, uh, we get the, the sense of a nation being born or a nation just coming to be. Um, this nation was born coming out of Egypt. And at this point here, the relationship of God and Israel is like that of a, of a parent and child, right? Um, God led the, the Israelites out of Egypt, um, was with them personally and, and physically, and took care of them as they came out, much like a parent would do it with a child. And we see here, it says, out of Egypt, I called my son. And it's very interesting. There's a lot of different uh, ways that, that we can take this here. This uh, uh, God is, uh, through Hosea, is talking about how um, God called Israel out of captivity, um, brought them out as a nation. Um, remember, they went into Israel or um, into Egypt uh, as a family of twelve. Now that twelve was, you know, they had lots of people with them, but uh, you know, the, it wasn't quite the millions that that came out of Egypt uh, four hundred years later. And so they go in as a family. Um, they come out as a as a nation, and so as they come out of Egypt here, uh, this is the birth of this of this nation, and uh, the relationship to that of parent and child. Um, it's also a foretelling when Jesus comes out of Egypt here as well. And if you look at Matthew two verses fifteen, it, it uh, references Matthew references this verse out of Hosea eleven one. Um, if you remember. Remember back, um, Herod had uh, um, charged that all the boys in, in the area be killed, um, I believe, what, under two or three years old um, to be killed. Um, Joseph, in a dream, is warned to go to Egypt, and so Joseph, Mary, and Jesus go down to Egypt, and then uh, they're called back out of Egypt. And so this is also foretelling here of Jesus coming out of Egypt. And it's interesting here, as we look at this, you know, um, we have this nation, God bringing this nation um, deliverance and salvation for his people coming out of Egypt. Uh, we also have the same thing for us, too, of Jesus coming out of Egypt, um, uh, our deliverance and salvation coming out of Egypt as well. So there's a lot of uh, um, uh, similarities there for, for the Israelites at this time and for us as Christians. Verse 2. The more I called Israel, the further they went away from me. Here's my question. Why does that happen? All right, I, I should say this. Do you see this happening? Those of you with children, um, the more that you call, do the more, do they go away? Just curious. Well, we've used the word selective hearing with our children many times. Okay. Um, yes, and I, Jesse. <laughs> I don't I'm just trying to think whether I've ever done that to my parents I know there have been uh, there there have been times in the past where the more I called someone the the less likely they were to answer and so I'm just thinking of some of those things some of those were in some business situations from a million years ago uh, you know some of those were were uh, more recent but yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just you know like, I like the way you say that. The, the more you call, the less they answer. It. For, it's not a good thing, but it just makes me chuckle. Yeah, yeah. You know, when, when, uh, when our eldest went to uh, college, uh, it was a long way away. And so we helped uh, him get all of his stuff there and get situated. And they had a, uh, like, a, uh, like a parent weekend, parent welcome weekend thing. And one of the things that I heard stressed by several different uh, speakers, they were mostly uh, department heads and stuff like that that you would go to. And, and uh, one thing they kept talking about was, you know, you've raised your kids in this household. And it's, it's you know, you've been in charge. And at, at that age, you know, the 18, 19, 20-year-old age, they are desperately wanting to be individuals. And so a lot of times they will make choices uh, different from yours just to be uh, their own selves, to be different mm -hmm. than you. And if, if, if you have tried to model 
the right decision every time and they make a different one in your mind that seems wrong like a wrong decision and uh, so it was just kind of unique to me how um, you know they were saying don't be surprised if your kid comes back with different color hair or a different hairstyle or even tattoos and things because they are wanting to do things they're wanting to be an individual which is different from you so mm -hmm. that's always going to feel like they're running away whether it is or isn't i mean oftentimes it is but sometimes yeah. it's just being unique mm -hmm. hmm. yeah well, i think interesting. we we experienced that actually when our kids were um slightly younger teens um what 15 or 16 um they they thought they knew better than we did. Yeah, they and, knew more uh, than we did. Yeah, they got smarter and we got dumber. Um, but by, by the grace of God, though, uh, you know, at least our personal experience, each one of our children came back um, in their late teens or early 20s and said, you know, sorry, Mom and Dad, wish we would have listened to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, the visual, too, I, I have with that verse is if you've trained um, dogs and you're trying to call them and, and they're just like running away from you, um, the one place we went said, turn around and run away from them. And then they usually turn around and want to follow you. Hmm. Yeah. Has anyone ever tried reverse psychology on, on kids? You call them, call them, they go the opposite way. They said, all right, well, then. Don't come. Yeah, like you said, with dogs, I'm going to run away. And <laughs> they, come, they come back. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, it's interesting here. I, and, and maybe this is just in, in our human nature, right? Um, that God is, it, you know, the relationship between God and Israel here is a parent and a child relationship. At least that's how it's being described. And, and God's saying, the more I called Israel, the further they went away. Um, yeah. Good. I think of the book of Jonah. That's, yeah. Uh, or that's Jonah right there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. He went the opposite way, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Continuing on in here in verse 2, we see that they sacrificed to the Baals and they burned incense to images. The... Uh, you know, Hosea talks about the Israelites uh, earlier in the book, and I believe it's probably chapter four or earlier in, in his book here, that the Israelites are still offering sacrifices to the Lord, and they're still celebrating the festivals. They, it's not like they haven't forgotten about the commandments um, that they are supposed to do. They are still doing it. However, they're still getting, they're still worshiping these, these other gods. I'm just curious, uh, as we look at this, you know, knowing that they're still, they're still, um, uh, celebrating the festivals, they're still, they know the book of the law, and yet they're still worshiping these other gods. How, how does a group of people like the Israelites here um, get to this point? And you can use maybe what, uh, what we read in Deuteronomy 8 um, as a reference there. How do you get to this point of, like, for the Israelites? What are your thoughts? Maybe you get to a place where they're they're feeling like they don't need God anymore, and that just leads them to uh, leads them to more freedom or or more more rebellion because they they're good on their own, right? They they've got all the answers, they've got all they need. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, in Deuteronomy eight, there it talks about them being comfortable and uh, you know becoming wealthy, and when you become wealthy, then you become comfortable. Um, and oftentimes when that happens, you tend to forget maybe where you came from or, or some of that. You want to say hi? <laughs> I got a helper. Um, and so, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's probably what happens here in, uh, for, for Israel, right? They, if we look at the, the warning in Deuteronomy 8, um, they became wealthy. They built cities. They settled down. Um, in the time of Solomon, right, there was a unprecedented peace, and they were the number one. They were, they were powerful. And uh, throughout that time, you know, once you become comfortable, wealthy, 
uh, you tend to forget where you came from. And it's interesting here in that they're, they're still doing the celebrations and they're still offering sacrifices to God. Um, but they are also sacrificing to the Baals. They're, they're doing all this other stuff that they shouldn't be doing there as well. And so that's what we see here in verse two. Brian? Yes. The other thing I thought about is you kind of like with any sin, sometimes you do something, it doesn't seem like that big a deal or, or whatever, but it's, it slowly grows. And you kind right. of wonder, did they, along with all their worshiping of the one true God, did, you know, one little thing come in and then it just sort of mm -hmm. compounded and got worse. Yeah. 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 It's, it's like desensitizing too, you mm -hmm. know, um, with the sin. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't know that it's happening to you. It's yeah. like a grad. It's like a gradual thing. I mean, because sure. they even started sacrificing their unwanted animals to mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. They they weren't even given their best, their first fruits, their yeah. their their first, their best. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see that in Malachi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they gave their their blemished animals to God. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. If you yeah, if you look back, um, you know, even even with Solomon, um, Solomon had many many wives, and a lot of them were political alliances and um, to to appease the nations between them. And so maybe you know some of this you know um, starts then. I like that. You know, it starts really slow and and gradual and and desensitized. Debbie, I like that that word that uh, you know you're you slowly over time. Um, it's seen as okay and it's seen as right and and then it, it progresses to the point that we have right here. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know that it's happening to us. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm the slow one. Let me make sure I'm getting this right. So the Israelites were trying to serve two different gods, playing both one end against the other, having their cake and eat it too and all that. That's just such a foreign concept in today's world, isn't it? <laughs> sarcasm alert sarcasm huh uh, uh. <laughs> well and you know it's interesting as we go through here with hosea um we're going to see that they're going to try they're they're going to try to um make alliances with the assyrians and with the egyptians and if you're trying to make good with uh the countries that are around you um you know, maybe you start uh, doing some things that, that uh, will make them view you in a better light so that we can make a treaty and we can make an alliance and, and all that. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, you know, and maybe that's what was happening here. You know, they're, uh, <laughs> that phrase, you have your cake and eat it too, right? Um, you're trying to play both, both uh, things there. That's good, yeah. Um, I was thinking too how I can't believe they saw all those miracles and found it so easy to turn to um, other gods. I just, it, it was hard to imagine being able to do that after seeing what they had seen. But, and, yeah. and I, know, yeah. uh, I know yesterday, and I, th I think, how can they go back to other gods? But then I was thinking, um, yesterday I was paying bills, and then I started looking at my checkbook, and then I looked at my savings, and then I started to worry about, you know, t tomorrow. And I mean, Dan and I are both working, and just, you know, I felt like I was almost making money, not my money, my God, another God. And it just was a small thing, a small thought. Mm -hmm. And that's how they started out. And just like um, your kids and in, in being involved in sports, it'll just be one Sunday. Well, then it's, oh, well, then two, two sure. days won't be bad. And, yeah. and I think it yeah. just creeps in. Uh, Give more money away. <laughs> yeah yeah i you know it's 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 uh you, you talk about the um uh, yeah that uh i lost my train of thought i'm sorry sorry <laughs> that's okay it happens you know, i was kind of thinking uh especially when we when we read the uh, deuteronomy passage the, the uh, a concept that's been rolling through my head a lot lately is is uh, I, I and you're all welcome to disagree with this, but I, I think there is the Lord has built in a need for resistance in our lives. Um, you know, you think of like a, a physical attribute. If you just sit on the, never do anything, then then your body deteriorates. 
but when you go out and you do physical work and you make your muscles work and actually get tired and hurt, that's when, when your body will uh, continue to be healthy. You know, of course, there's a lot of nutrition involved there. But I think it's the same thing emotionally. You know, if we don't have any uh, emotional stress or resistance, then we get complacent and we move away from God. And, you know, which is counterintuitive to our lifestyle, uh, at, at least mine, I want to reduce stress. You know, I, I see stress as bad. And, and I do, you know, I mean, it depends on how you determine stress. But, you know, I, I think God has put resistance in our lives so that we always point back to him. I think without that resistance, we tend to look inward and we need to look upward to him. So, you know, I mean, that's just kind of my thought. I, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, you're all welcome to disagree. No, I think that's, that's, that's true. And, and I think we're going to see that um, in one of these other verses. So when we get to that, uh, we'll come back to that um, there. Um, back to Amy, um, you know, forgetting the miracles, uh, you, you're talking about, about that. And I think that's the why, you know, as I, as I go through life, I like telling stories and, and going back, remembering what, uh, you know, what had happened and, and all that. And you're talking about those miracles, you know, the, uh, the, the people living at this time or several, several generations removed from a lot of the miracles that, that had happened. And, and, you know, we know, you know, what, what happens when time moves on with the impact of, of certain, certain events, um, you know, in my lifetime right now, right? Um, you know, I, September 11th, I can remember that day. You know, you just saw I had a, a uh, loss of thought right there just this then. But if you ask me where was I at September 11th, 2001, I, I could tell you what car I was driving. I could tell you, uh, you know, the whole details of that day. You know, that has stuck in my head. But, you know, my freshmen, no, seniors, seniors this year was the first group of kids that were born after September 11th and um, you know asking them well how, how did you learn about this oh from the history books you know that they you know it's just interesting that there's not that that uh, personal personal connection there and so it doesn't have that same same impact and so telling stories of what you know even like the day like that what that day was like and and, you know, that was the, the whole purpose of, you know, the law and Deuteronomy and, and Exodus and all this to help them remember that. And they say, you know, if you forget this, um, destruction is going to come your way. And so, you know, uh, telling stories and, and what uh, Frank said there, of, you know, uh, yeah, we don't want to have stress and we're, we're trying to make our lives as comfortable as we want. But what good story comes out of being very comfortable? Oh, I was able to eat well today, and that was, you know, no, you know, oh, I was hungry. I needed to go out, and there was this deer that came by just at the right time, and I was shaking from starvation, and I shot the deer, and then I ate it, and I was good. You know, that makes a much better story than than saying I was really comfortable, right? And so, it's just it's interesting here of you know, the things that we try to do, which we want. Um, kind of go opposite of what makes us grow, maybe. And uh, I think we'll see that later on here. Let's go on here to verse 7. Verse 7, it says here, and I, I like the language that it says. It says, my people are determined to turn from me. Uh, determined. This is not an accident, right? This is not them accidentally turning away from God. It says, my people are determined. If you're determined to do something, um, it is very calculated. It is um, planned out. You know, people have made a choice here to turn away from God. And as we reflect on that, that there, you know, that makes it all the more worse. If you have someone who's actively going against you and not accidentally, um, you think about, you know, someone uh, intentionally going against what you're trying to do. Um, how does, what does that stir up in you as you think about that? Especially if it's, uh, you know, a child. If a child is doing something just to get under your skin, um, you think of that emotion that comes up there. You tell them not to do this and they kind of give you a, a wry grin and, and then they do it. And uh, the, the emotion that just uh, 
stokes in you, right? That's what's happening here between Israel and, and God. Uh, Israel has determined to do this, um, is actively going against. Then, <clears throat> you know, if that's enough to store up wrath in us, uh, what does that do with God there, right? And we see that uh, God's wrath is getting stirred up. The second part there, um, though, it says, even if they call to the Most High, will no, by no means exalt them. Um, as we saw in the, the previous verses and, and previously in Hosea, Israel's still calling on God. They're still doing sacrifices. They're still celebrating the festivals. But because they are also calling on other gods, God's not going to save them from exile. And so what comes up with this, uh, you know, a term that <clears throat> I think of uh, with this right here is, uh, you know, this tough love. Um, you allow something bad to happen to someone because in the end, it, it'll produce something beneficial. And, uh, you know, going back to Frank's point there of, of stress and uh, this resistance and, and the hardships and all that uh, making you a better person, right? Um, tough love. Uh, you allow something bad to happen. Um, it's not that you hate them. But you love them because you know that in the end, uh, something uh, beneficial is going to happen from that. And I think that's what God is, is looking here. Even though they call on my name um, because of their sin of calling on other gods, I'm going to allow um, this uh, punishment to happen. Let me continue on verse 8. He says, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over Israel? Ephraim is just another name here for Israel at this, at this point. Um, as we look at these verses, God loves Israel. God has this love. He, he made a covenant with Abraham. He loves his, this people. And he says, you know, how can I give you up, even though you've done this? Um, how can I, you know, how can I turn, uh, you know, he loves them. He loves them with this, with this all-encompassing love. And, and uh, he's saying, how can I give them up? How can I do that? He says here, how can I treat you like Adma? And how can I make you like Zeboim? And I'm curious, is there anyone here? I'm looking at Colton Stephanie there. Um, uh, anyone quiz on Genesis at all? You two didn't. Uh, Jesse, were you quiz master at the time or, or Melanie with during Genesis? Yes, uh, we were. Yeah. So you should know Adma and Zeboyim, right? I, no, you I have the, the, I was you, the guy that asked the questions. I was not the guy that answered them. And you had the answers in front of you too, so you didn't have to know it, right? That's, that's right. That's, that's why you have answer sheets, right? <laughs> Well, I will, I will confess here. I did quiz on Genesis in at least a, a couple years, maybe, and I didn't recognize these two, these two cities. But uh, if you go back into Genesis, and um, <clears throat> there's a story of a group of four kings and there's a group of five kings, and they kind of go against each other. They're, they're warring against each other, and Abram comes down and helps out Cato Lemur. Cato Le, yeah, that guy. Um, I think he was leading the, he was the leader of either the four or five Kings. Um, but if you go back into the stories, uh, each one of these cities had, had a leader, which was named a King and Adma and Zeboim is mentioned in that, uh, they're, they, uh, uh, Shemember, remember Shemember? Uh, I remember that name anyway. Shemember was the King of Zeboim. And anyhow, um, the, uh, so th these towns are mentioned in Genesis, and, and the Israelites at the time would know these, these two cities. Um, these cities were destroyed uh, when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because they were in the plain of, of that, same, that same area. It would be kind of like for us here saying, you know, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia are the two big cities that everyone knows in Pennsylvania, but in between there you got uh, Ackland and Oxford, right? Um, if Philadelphia and Pittsburgh get destroyed and everything in between, Ackland and Oxford are gone too. And so um, that's kind of the idea here that uh, we have um, Adma and Zeboim. Cities on the plain destroyed with uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And God is saying right here, how can I treat you like them? Right? How can I make you like them? He can't because he loves them. And so he says here, my heart is changed within me. All my compassion is around. Rouse. It's not that God changes. Um, it's just that this part of God's character wasn't revealed quite yet in our in our text. And and although God is angry and God has this wrath, uh, His compassion is going to temper His anger 
Um, and I like that phrase, and it's going to come back uh, here in a little bit, but uh, compassion tempers your anger. Um, basically, he's not going to make them like these cities, uh, but he's not going to allow them to escape punishment as well, right? He's not going to destroy Israel. He's not going to go through and do that. Like, uh, you know, even back in, and uh, as they're coming out of the, out of Egypt, um, God wanted to destroy Israel at that time. And Moses kind of in an exchange uh, talked him out of that. But, uh, you know, God has the love for this people so much so that, you know, even though they go and, and uh, intentionally go against him, um, he's not going to destroy them at, at what we see there in, in verse 8. Verse 9, right? I will not carry out my fierce anger, although he could because God is holy. Um, it says here, for he is God and not man. God's response is different than man's response in this situation. God is thoughtful. He's measured in his actions. He has a, maybe sometimes we say, we, you know, people have a longer view instead of a short view. Um, of things, um, you know, he is God. He's not a man. He's not going to react um, like a man. I'm not going to come against their cities again. He's not going to destroy uh, the cities, but he will punish them. And then verse 10 says, they will follow the Lord, right? And this will be after the exile, after the punishment um, that God's going to inflict on it. What's going to be the result? <clears throat> they will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. Uh, his children will come trembling from the west. Um, and this is from Egypt. The, uh, the northern kingdom um, was exiled by Assyrians, and, and some of them actually went down to Egypt as well. Uh, the southern kingdom was the one that was exiled uh, to the east in Babylon. And so you see here in actually verse 11 in Hosea, I'll just read it here quick. It says, they will come trembling like birds from Egypt, like doves from Assyria. I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. And so we use uh, 11 to kind of, um, interpret 10 here in that, uh, you know, some of these uh, in the northern kingdom, northern kingdom of Israel are going to be going off into Egypt there. They will follow the Lord. That's going to be the result of this uh, punishment that's going to happen. All right, so that is Hosea here, this chapter 11, um, and some of the prophecy for the people of Israel. What are some takeaways for us? And so I have a few questions here, and, and if uh, something um, stokes you to talk, uh, go ahead and do that. We have here uh, the first one. Do we fall in the trap of the more we are called, the more we fall away? And we kind of talked about that here. Um, you know, Ross brought up Jonah, right? Uh, and, you know, do we make excuses if God calls us to a certain thing? And uh, I don't know if you have any, any examples of that there um, with that. You know, if God is calling us to, to go and do something somewhere, um, the more God calls us, are we, are we like a child and say, well, we want to make an identity for ourselves. We want to do our own thing, our own decisions. Uh, do we make excuses if God calls us to a certain thing? When you um, talked about that, I thought of um, the battle that um, Paul struggled with the, the natural law. Mm -hmm. um, that's our sinful self. Mm -hmm. We all have that struggle. And that took me, when you guys, when you were talking about that, I don't know who was talking about that. Um, I just uh, went to that. And um, th that battle, each one of us has that daily, whether you're a Christian or not. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that battle is found in um, Romans 7. And, um, you know... The, the more you follow, I think the, the battle is that much stronger, I think. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we're at war. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, and I think, yeah, I think, I think uh, Satan and his cohorts are more after you um, mm -hmm. the, the deeper that you follow. Yeah. I, I, mm -hmm. And I, I, so may, maybe if you're not following, then the Satan already has you and you're in Babylon, I guess. Yeah, yeah. The world. So you're already there. So you're not really at war. You're just, I got you. Ha ha ha. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you're there. But when, when you're a follower or a believer, you're, you're at war. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the struggle is daily and it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Good. So that's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why the Israelites had a hard time. Yeah. And yeah. continue. Yeah. To have mm -hmm. a hard time because mm -hmm. they're our teachers. They're the Levites. They're they're supposed to be teaching us, and they're coming back to teaching us, and we're coming together now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to to teach the messianic um, teachings now. Yeah, yeah. Because we're living in prophetic times right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Another question from these uh, verses. Uh, back there in uh, verse 7, it says, my people are determined. Um, when I thought about that question, or that, in that verse, I was like, are we determined to follow Christ? Or is it an accident that we are following Christ, and when persecution comes, we'll, uh, we fall away? Um, I just got thinking about that, that uh, term there, determined, right? Uh, you know, are we determined? Are we determined to follow Christ? Or do we start following Christ as an accident and, you know, when trouble comes, like when Debbie says, Satan comes and, and starts uh, really getting on at us, will we, will we fall away? Um, and that's something for you to think about there. Have you, have you made a determination um, to follow Christ or is it just kind of a happy accident? Who said happy accident? Anyone remember? Anyone watch PBS on Saturday afternoons way back in the day? <laughs> <laughs> Bob Ross. Bob Ross, happy accents. Okay. Verse 8. When we look at verse 8, um, how, does, how does verse 8 give you encouragement when you fall into sin? And how can we use this verse to help others who feel uh, their bad decisions cannot be forgiven? Look at verse 8 here, right? Um, God has this all-encompassing love for the Israelites, and, and he basically says to them, you know, I can't destroy you. I can't destroy you. I love you too much. Um, how, how am I going to, how am I going to destroy you? Yeah, you may uh, experience some consequences of your sin and all that, but, but I'm not going to destroy you. I'm not going to give up on you. And, and I hope that we um, can take that same encouragement. Um, when we fall into sin, uh, maybe we can use this verse. Um, this set of verses as God's character to Israel, um, which is the same character to us as Christians, that um, we haven't done anything that, that God will, will not um, forgive us, right? Uh, the bad decisions in your life, um, God, God loves you too much to, to let, that, let that go. There is one, uh, but that is, you know, we go back into the uh, determined um, you know, you made a calculated effort and uh, planned it out and a number of things the scripture says uh, going against God. Uh, but, you know, other stuff that we have done in our past, uh, we're not that far away from God's forgiveness. And I think verse eight can help us with that. And then, um, you know, in verse four, uh, verse nine, um, I'm just curious here, you know, how can we follow God's lead in verse nine? Um, God had every right, because he was holy, to get rid of the Israelites. Uh, the Israelites were determined to, uh, to discontinue following God. Um, we see that many times throughout the Old Testament here, and time and time again, God um, doesn't destroy them. Um, and God says this right here, I am God and not man. I will not come in wrath. And I'm just curious here, um, you know, how can we follow God's lead in this. Um, if someone shows grace to another when they should have, uh, uh, when, when they had every right to uh, retaliation, retribution, money, whatever it may be, if someone shows grace to that person, do we call them out and tell them they should have gone after that person or do we commend them for showing grace? And that's something that, uh, uh, you know, many times I, I can think of different instances in which I acted differently than what people would have expected in that situation. And uh, a lot of times they, they say, oh, I would have acted differently. It, was, it would have been in your right to go and, and do X, Y, and Z or, or all that. And, you know, why, why didn't you do that? Um, I'm just, uh, for me, it, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge that... Um, 
we see here, if we're trying to, to follow after Christ and, and his, um, his leading and his example, um, I feel, you know, even though it may be justified for us to go after someone monetarily or um, verbally or whatever it may be, um, I think there's a big challenge for us to, to follow after what God, uh, God does, especially right here. Um, allowing his compassion to temper his wrath and saying, yes, I could have done this. I've been in, in full, um, I'd be justified if you want to use that word to destroy the Israelites, but because I love them um, and because of, of my grace, um, I'm not going to do that. And so I, I think that's a, a challenge for us. Um, and you can think about that, how that may uh, look like in, you, in your life. Is there a time in which you give up your rights um, to show compassion and grace to someone else. Um, yeah, think about that. Um, and at the conclusion, if we want to discuss that, we can. All right, the last half of our lesson. Hi. Yes. Restate that question again. That could be taken two ways. Is there a time when we give up our compassion? Say. So... You know, if we look at what God was doing here in verse 9, and, he, and basically he's saying, I am God, not man. And so I'm not going to let my wrath um, in destruction of the, you know, God had every, every right or was justified in destroying the nation of Israel because of their determination not to follow after him. And he says, because I am God and not a man, I'm not going to do that um, because I love him too much. And so my, my question here, challenge is, if, if we are trying to follow after, after God um, in Christ, who are one, um, are there times in which, you know, we, we would be justified in doing a certain action that we decide, no, we're not going to do that because of our grace and compassion for another, another person? I'm not saying that that is necessarily all the time, um, but it's... It, uh, you know, someone said, what, uh, oh, you, you, Ross, were the one that's saying about, you know, serving God and serving someone else. Um, and how can, you know, can we have our cake and eat it too? And, and uh, sarcastically you say, you know, how, how is that viewed today? You know, we, uh, we think of, of, uh, yeah, if, if someone does something bad to you, there is retribution in our society for you to get paid back, right? And are there times that we do that? Are there times that we show compassion and say, don't worry about it? I don't know. Does that make sense, Ross? Yes, it does. It does. I, 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 miss, I thought you were saying that we give up our right to compassion and whatever, and then we go the other way with, with anger. Oh, okay. No, 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 no. But there should be accountability. There, sure, there, sure. there needs to be an accountability. There's always consequences for sin, right? And yes. God, God says that there are, there are consequences for this. Um, yeah. Retribu retribution is God's. Right, right. It is, it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But there is accountability. Sure, sure. Yeah. Speaking of that, Debbie, uh, hey, there was a, there's a case that's been going on in the federal courts for a year now. Colton, some of Robert, some of the other guys might be about uh, trickling streams, trickling springs, creamery out in Chambersburg um, that was owned by different Mennonite investors and farmers um, that wound up in federal court. And I mean, just ugly, ugly. I pulled an article out of the Washington Post, I believe. So it was national news. and course they highlight the fact that this was owned by Mennonites and and uh, I mean it's yeah what did they wind up Robert Robert if you know anything about it chime in but it was like 60 million 70 million that they had to repay because they were taking they were getting money from farmers and investors and they weren't using it to pay down their debt and you could just see it snowballing and and so these guys were excommunicated from the church and um, just the whole, there will be payback. And it looks like the main one 
or maybe all four of the guys who are in it have all pledged, you know, yeah, we've lost everything, but we're going to pay this back. You know, we've been excommunicated from our churches, um, but we are going to pay this money back. But Google it if you guys have time, because uh, the reporting on it um, and the fact of the attention of the attention it got should should uh, kind of serve as a sober reminder to us uh, to watch what we're doing because once <laughs> once you do something that yeah it becomes public then you drag the church down or anyway so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody should be accountable for what they do. You know, mm -hmm. there is an accountability. For yeah, your yeah. actions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to come out. <clears throat> All right, Nothing let's go here to the uh, the last part here of Hosea, Hosea twelve, and I'll go and read uh, verses one to two, and then six to fourteen. Ephraim feeds on the wind. He pursues the east wind all day and multiplies lies and violence. He makes a treaty with Assyria and sends olive oil to Egypt. The Lord has a charge to bring against Judah. He will punish Jacob according to his ways and repay him according to his deeds. And then uh, verse 6. But you must return to your God. Maintain love and justice and wait for your God always. The merchant uses dishonest scales. He loves to defraud. Ephraim boasts, I am very rich. I have become wealthy. With all my wealth, they will not find in me the, any inequity or sin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. I will make you live in tents again, as in the days of your appointed feast. I spoke to the prophets, gave them many visions, and told parables through them. Is Gilead wicked? Its people are worthless. Do they sacrifice bulls in Gilgal? Their altars will be like piles of stones on a plowed field. Jacob fled to the country of Aram. Israel served to get a wife, and to pay for her, he tended sheep. The Lord used a prophet to bring Israel up from Egypt. By a prophet, he cared for them. But Ephraim was, has bitterly provoked him to anger. His Lord will leave upon him the guilt of his bloodshed, and he will repay him for his contempt. Let's look here at verse 1. Verse 1, Ephraim feeds on the wind. He pursues the east wind all day. Um, what we're seeing here is Israel seeking a treaty with Assyria and Egypt. Right uh, to to uh, secure their safety, um, and so in doing so, they're doing that instead of seeking and relying on God. Um, they're trying to make allies with the powers around them. Um, verse two, we have here the Lord has uh, Lord has a charge to bring against Judah. Um, right, this is a formal language of a lawsuit. Um, so you know, fairly um, official and and uh, meaningful stuff here. It says here he will punish Jacob. And we see punish Jacob, uh, both kingdoms, the northern and southern kingdom, um, are, are descendants of Jacob. And so by saying this, um, it's, he's including both kingdoms in this uh, consequence that's going to come about um, because they both come from Jacob. And they're going to say, let's say here, repay him according to his deeds, um, which uh, makes us look back at, at who Jacob who Jacob was in, in verses 3 to 5, it talks about um, some of uh, what Jacob, uh, who he was and what he did. But uh, if you can remember back, Jacob um, uh, was a deceiver. Um, at one point, Jacob shows favoritism and, and a bunch of other things there as well. And, and uh, you know, we talk about little things that uh, turn into really big things. Um, you know, I believe that some of this little stuff right here turned into big things uh, many years and generations later. Verse 6, which I think is our uh, memory verse, our key verse here for this lesson. Um, you must return to God, right? Uh, language of repentance it says here, uh, return to God, uh, repent. Uh, it says maintain love and justice. Um, this here is going to be the proof of returning to God. If you actually repented, um, then you're going to be able to uh, maintain love and justice. If you haven't, um, I don't know, and we can talk about this later, but I don't know if you can be loving and just if you haven't return um, to God. And it says, wait for God always. Um, you know, does this mean that we do nothing? We just sit there passively and wait? Um, I don't believe it's what it means. Um, it means an active and complete trust in God's plans and timing. It means working alongside of God and, and uh, seeking after God and, and uh, learning about what his, what his plan for your life is and, and uh, acting on it. Um, not doing things for ourselves necessarily, uh, but in all things that we do, uh, seeking after God and, and making sure that we're living in his will with that. So um, this waiting 
um, for God always. Verse seven, uh, we get into, yeah. So uh, Sue and I, we've, we've already started going back to uh, Bible study for about a month now. Mm -hmm. uh, we go to Bible study on Willow Street. Um, so, um, but we've talked about what is the uh, first word in uh, the gospel? Mm -hmm. What is it? Well, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> what, in the gospel of Matthew? No, the, the whole gospel. What's the first word of, of the gospel? You is just it brought it up. You just brought it up in verse 6. Repent. 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 Yeah. Repent. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, sure. that's all I had to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You brought it up. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. Right. Yeah. Uh, we we, look all, at, we uh, all forget, but that's the first word of the, of the gospel is that we need to repent. Yeah. Repent and return to the Lord. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. How yeah. can we do any of the other stuff that God calls us to do if we don't do that first, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's all it's already been said in the Old Testament right sure. here. Sure. I mean, that's the main theme, right? Mm -hmm. You just brought it up. Yeah, I yeah. It. Yeah, no, good, thanks. <laughs> um, verse 7, and going on here, uh, next couple of verses, the... God is uh, giving a, a description of uh, who Israel is here. And the first one here, it, the, uh, God compares Israel to a merchant that uses dishonest scales and loves to defraud. Um, we call that injustice, right? Someone that uses dishonest scales. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind was uh, Proverbs 11.1. 1. The Lord abhors dishonest scales, right? Um, this, this nation at this time is not showing justice and love, and, and we've studied that many uh, different ways here the last quarter of how that injustice is, is being played out. Uh, but we get an analogy here of Israel being like a merchant who uses dishonest scales, loves to defraud. Uh, verse 8, Ephraim, which is Israel here again, is boasting. What are they boasting about? They're boasting about their wealth. And how do they get the wealth? Right? I've become wealthy um, with my own hands. Again, back to Deuteronomy. If you uh, remember what Moses warned, if uh, – you know, you're saying that you got wealthy by your own hands, um, then you don't need anyone else. Um, we see here arrogance settling in uh, with this uh, second part. <clears throat> with my wealth, they will not find me with iniquity or sin. And I think there's a couple different ways that you can interpret this, right? Um, if I'm very wealthy, then I can do whatever I want, right? If uh, there's injustice that is found, I'll buy the person off and say, here, here's a some gold, um, don't find me guilty, bribing. Um, the other thing is, you know, when we, when we get into this arrogant attitude, we think that things will not come to light. And that goes back to what Ross was talking about with that, uh, um, you know, with that uh, law or that, um, what do I want to say, that case that you were talking about there, right? Um, you think, oh, uh, what I'm doing is not going to come to light. And boy, when it does, it has uh, repercussions all, all over the place with that, right? And so this arrogance that Israel has because of its wealth and its power and all that um, is not good. Verse 9, I am the Lord God, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, right? Again, God is reasserting who he is um, and kind of playing back in the verse 11, or, uh, chapter 11, verse 1, when he's talking about bringing out, uh, Israel out of Egypt. Um, you know, again, just re reasserting who he is. And he says, I will make you live in tents again. They did live in tents. They lived in tents when they were in the wilderness. Uh, who can tell me why were they in the wilderness for 40 years? That wasn't God's intent. They didn't believe about the fruit. Yeah. They didn't they, believe they, they were scared. They, they were scared. Except they wanted to go back them, to Egypt. Two of them were not. Right. But they didn't right. believe the two. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, they, they wanted, they, they were, they were scared. And so, um, you know, God said, all right, well then you're going to be wandering around the wilderness until that generation that was scared and wouldn't believe in God, um, has died. So they lived in exile for turning away from God and God's saying here, you know, uh, you have a festival of, of tents that, that you commemorate this with. Um, I'm going to make you live in, uh, in tents again, um, for your sin. Uh, verse 10, 
we see here God speaking to the prophets, gave them many visions and told parables through them. Uh, God gave their people plenty of warning. You look through the, all of the, uh, I mean, it started with Moses back in Deuteronomy. There was enough warning for the people of Israel here um, for them to turn, turn around. We have verse 11, uh, a couple of places that are mentioned here. Gilead. Gilead is a site of a, of a major pagan shrine in which they were offering sacrifices to Baal. Um, we have Gilgal. Gilgal is a site near Jericho where the Israelites put up a religious shrine there as well. Um, altars. When you look at altars, altars are, are uh, you know, very meticulously put together, um, structures um, made to look nice and, and all that. Uh, God saying that their altars would be like piles of stones on a plowed field. Um, you know, when the Israelite farmers were plowing, they find a rock, you throw it onto a pile, and um, that's where it's stays and maybe that's the same way uh for farmers here today you find a pile of rocks and it doesn't look like a very intricate and ornate uh altar um basically god's saying these altars are going to be destroyed uh because of this verse 12 jacob fled to the country of aram uh for safety and as he was going um he uh served to get her wife and um to pay for her he tended sheep right uh uh, this is an analogy of what Israel is trying to do now. Jacob fled uh, for safety and to find safety, and now Israel is doing the same thing with their alliances with Assyria and Egypt and trying to find safety. But they're not going to find it um, with Egypt or, or Assyria. Um, they can only find it with God. Verse 13, the Lord used a prophet to bring Israel up from Egypt. By a prophet, he cared for them. Um, God used uh, prophets um, all the time, and if they would have listened to them, uh, they could have got out of the issues that they're going to face, but they decide not to do that and not to listen uh, to the prophets, which leads us to 14 here. But Ephraim, or Israel, has bitterly provoked him to anger. Um, his Lord will leave him upon the guilt of his bloodshed and will repay him for his contempt. Uh, we see here Israel is going to face these consequences, both the uh, the north and the southern kingdom are going to face the consequences of their sin. Um, God's protection will be withdrawn, but as we saw back in, in chapter 11, God's not going to destroy them. Uh, but as Debbie brought up with that word accountability, there's going to be some accountability for their sin here um, during this time. Okay, so that's the, the, the prophecy here for Israel. What are some takeaways uh, from us um, as we look at these verses? First one. Is the return to God a once and done thing, or is it continual? Verse 6, it says you must return to God. How about uh, for you in your life? The return to God a once and done thing, or is it a continual process? It's a continual process. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree it's a continual process. Um, relationship. Uh, one of the things I've learned in working with animals is that you can't just do something once and expect the, the animal to, to learn it and to obey or whatever. It's a continual process. Uh, our relationship with God is a relationship. It's not something that's a once and done, check it off the box, and now I can go on my way. Um, you know, returning to God, uh, once we accept Christ, you know, that's, that's a once and done thing, and that is uh, forever. But uh, continue to come back to God and maintain a relationship it requires um, that um, coming back in and, and re-examining your life and, and, you know, maybe having someone say, Hey, this part of your life that you've been doing for a while is not right. You need to, you need to change, you know, accountability and all that. Um, it's a continued thing. Verse six here, we see a call to maintain love and justice. And I believe that that call is for us today. And, and uh, what uh, Jesus talks about in the scripture, I believe, is, uh, is reinforces what we see here in verse 6. Um, how do you maintain love and justice? We have to be accountable to ourselves, too. Yeah. We have to have an accountability partner. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think it's part of that daily thing that you're talking about, Ryan. I mean, we have to daily be building our relationship with God. And, and part of that is a, is attention to love and justice because God wants, Jesus says, love God and, and also love your neighbor. And so yeah. those, are, those are things that have to have, they take maintenance, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
I like that word that that is used here that uh, maintain right maintenance uh, when you when you're maintaining something again it's not a once and done thing and then you go off and do something else and forget about it it's uh, a continual um, type thing well, and if you look at if you look at the verse it's maintain love and justice comma and wait for your God always so the always is tied in with yeah. Um, yeah, that that whole phrase. It's not just waiting for your God always. It's sure. in love and justice always. So that always uh, is, uh, yeah, returning to God, maintaining love and justice, and waiting. Yeah, yeah, I like it. And I, I think that justice has to come from the love. You know, if uh, justice comes from love, whereas if, if there's no love involved, then it's either you know retribution or you know. A payback or vengeance you know so if without love it's it's not from God mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we know love is just not a feeling we know love is an action word yeah 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 exactly mm -hmm. next feelings question are, yeah. yeah feelings are wishy-washy yeah we can't trust yeah. them we can't trust <laughs> that's feelings right. that's right <laughs> <clears throat> Next question, yeah, how do we wait for God, that active and complete trust in God? Um, you know, think about, uh, how, how, you know, how do we go about doing that? I think uh, a number of things that we talked about here uh, plays into that, uh, having a relationship with God and, and uh, uh, with each other and, and returning to, you know, continue to return back to God there. Um, in verse 8, First eight, I believe we see a warning here. Um, Ephraim boasts, I'm very rich. I've become wealthy with all my wealth. They will not find me in any iniquity and sin. Um, all throughout the Bible, I believe that it's not a sin to be wealthy. Um, but I think there are some, some warnings that come along with having, uh, having wealth. And this is one of those places <coughs> where we see some warning. Um, you know, the more money that you have, um, the more secure you feel. I don't know. Um, well, it almost sounds it, it almost sounds to me like he's trying to equate success with righteousness. Yeah, and, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, the question I have there is, you know, how do we how do we not fall in that trap that Israel had here with uh, wealth and and this. Uh, security and all that and uh what was it debbie i think you said give away your money right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and i threw you off i didn't mean to throw you off no, no I, th I think that that fits in here right um you know if, if you don't want to become uh complacent and uh dependent upon your wealth what do you need yeah, to do but, yeah but if you give it away then you might end up getting more <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that from a certain preacher too. So <laughs> that's all right. That's more for God, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, and that's <laughs> tough from a society standpoint because whenever somebody is successful, uh, then we tend to listen to them more. We give them that stage. We give them that honor as mm -hmm. a society. And so we have to be careful not to, you know, to, to, to look to God and not to people. Yeah. 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 Um, there was a speaker at Sandy Cove we heard, and he was in Africa talking to, you know, a, a vill village. And um, he said to the leader of the village, you know, I, I pray that in your, um, in your he, poverty, essentially, you know, I, I hope you um, are still able to find God. And the leader of the village said, I pray in your prosperity that you don't forget him. So, yeah. you know, it's easy to do that. Yeah, yeah. I have, I have two quick quotes from Spurgeon on this. It says, uh, don't let your material prosperity mark your spiritual downfall. Hmm. And, then, and then the second one is, satisfied with earth, we are content to do without heaven. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's a, it's a challenge for us because, you know, we, we look here at what did Moses say at the beginning of the nation and what do we see here? You know, um, again, wealth not being bad, but 
boy, it, uh, it, it can really make you put your trust into something that's not God. All right. <clears throat> In conclusion, um, there was a phrase uh, that uh, was in the commentary, and so I, I really like it, and, and I want just to end with this. How do we live this phrase out? Help us put hands and feet to our claims to follow you and convict us when we don't. Help us put hands and feet to our claims to follow you and convict us when we don't. When we're looking at our relationships with our neighbors, the people around us, our society and all that, you know, our claim to follow Jesus needs to have some action to it. And I like that. Help us put hands and feet to our claims. And, and I'll be honest, you know, uh, um, I'm getting to not necessarily dislike social media, but uh, parts of it uh, just kind of rub me the wrong way. But, uh, you know, we see a lot of injustices in our, in our, um, in our society. Um, and if we claim to be following Christ, how are we putting hands and feet to that? Um, and not just the big ones that, that are, that are out and about, but, you know, just the, some other injustices that, that, uh, we see and, and, and we work towards, um, I like that. I like that phrase. Help us put feet, hands and feet to our claims to follow you. And Ryan, don't you think that, don't you think that's a huge point with, um, with all the, the protests and the rioting and all that stuff that's happening right now in so many places. Um, of course, that's complex stuff and there's all kinds of people involved, but you know, there are some people that are, I like what you're saying about social media because I'm a bit of a cynic, I guess, when it comes to, to much of that as well. You know, people are really quick to, to go on Twitter or Facebook or whatever their platform and just you know, rant about some problem, uh, but mm -hmm. then, they're not investing any time or any money or any prayer in, in actually doing anything about it. And, and so that's, that's a reminder to me. I don't want to be that way. Um, yeah. But I think that's, that's very common and that's very socially acceptable in our world. And, and I think that's another one of those things we need to maintain, you know, just, Hey, let our love be real. Let, let this be a daily thing to, to really follow God, really love people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any practical ways that, uh, that the group here that I'm looking at right now um, that we, you can encourage us all with of how do we put hands and feet to our claims that we follow Christ? A lot of things I've been convicted of over the, uh, you know, as I've been a teacher is, you know, words matter. And even though the intent of what you, what the kids say, or I say, uh, may not be what, uh, the intent may not be bad. Uh, it can come off as bad. And so I've been really encouraged to really watch words and, and how we use words because words do matter to, to people. Um, even though you may say, ah, oh, I've done, that's not what I meant. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I've been convicted that, that words do matter and to really call out, uh, that's one of the ways I, I feel I can be the hand and feet to the claim here of, you know, if someone says a word that, you know, that's not what they, yeah, to call them out on it. So I, Ross, I saw you were unmuted. What, do you have something you want to say? No, you were asking for examples. Um, we have a lady that lives directly across the end of our farm lane uh, for a few years. She's lived there now and, and she lost her husband three or four years ago. Um, we kind of watched it happen with ambulances and stuff. Um, there were different episodes and everything and then finally he passed and, and I think my mom reached out to her a little bit and established a friendship but since my father's passed, uh, Marietta is her name, and I believe she's Roman Catholic. Um, she was a nurse somewhere. She has just um, kind of humbled my mom with how much she's, you know, bringing down meals and planting flowers at the end of the lane for mom and just all this stuff. And it's been like, I mean, if mom and I have kind of said, well, what, what did you do for, I mean, it's like, mom, what, 
well, I, you know, I went up and visited. I didn't, you know, she's doing more for me than what I thought I did for her, you know, so it's been kind of humbling to watch that. Mm -hmm. um, have yeah. Conversations with them. Yeah. Think about that and, and share with share with others, you know, and, and find ways and, and really pray the, to God to, you know, help us put hands and feet to our claims that we follow you and don't make excuses and run away from him if he if he makes something really clear that this is something that you need to do. And, you know, maybe it is uh, putting stuff on social media or something, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you know, if, if that's what we're called to do and, and let's do it. Uh, the second part to that uh, is convict us when we don't, you know. Um, and that, that comes that accountability. Debbie, I, I like that word that you brought up here again, that accountability. Convict us when we don't. Um, if we don't put hands and feet action to the claims that we have of Christ, and it's pretty obvious that we could, um, we, we need to. And, and we need to be convicted of that. And that's where relationships with other accountability partners or Bible studies or, you know, even our own congregation um, – group of body of believers, uh, I think is, is really helpful for us to, to convict it. Not, not in a judgmental way, but, um, you know, in a, a restorative way, a restorative, uh, meaning that, okay, I should have done something. I didn't, here's how I can do better next time. And, and, uh, so I really, I, that, that really stuck out to me here in this commentary is actually a prayer. And so, um, I'm going to, to leave that with you here as a prayer as we end here um jesse they, it can continue on but i have to actually go to my grandpa so i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, sign out here after i say this uh, one last thing but uh um if you want to discuss more or, or come up with some other ways that we can put hands and feet to to claims and and uh think of ways of maybe we can convict uh you know how god convicts us when we don't um but let this let the be our prayer for today all right lord help us put hands and feet to our claims to follow you and convict us when we don't. Amen. Hey, thank you.